Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our week seven mission, uh, Games in Sci-Fi. Before we get started, we want to get just a couple of announcements out of the way. Uh, if you want to be a member, it's $6 for the semester. You can talk to Tulio over there about that. Um, gets you discounts on t-shirts, keychains, all sorts of star swag. Um, but most importantly, it'll get you just discounts on tickets to Starfest, which Ava is going to very kindly talk about. Starfest! Starfest is this Saturday. It starts at 11 and it goes until 11.30. No, it's not half an hour. It is 11 a.m. to 11.30 p.m. Not half an hour. It's half an hour plus 12. Yeah. Uh, so we have a wonderful guest for Starfest this year, uh, the creator of Ava Steven, Michelle uh, Tchaikovsky. Tchaikovsky. I apologize. Um, and she is holding a panel at 12.30. Uh, her panel is... I mean, if you want to go see her panel about the making of Ava's Demon, um, please come to the convention. That is the only way you're going to see it. Uh, she will also be having a vendor table uh, for the majority of the rest of the convention if you want to, like, go buy some stuff from her or talk to her. She seems really cool. Um, also, at Starfest, uh, you can learn to lightsaber fight. Do your friends. Do your mentor. There will also be, uh, along with Michelle, a lot of other vendors selling cool sci-fi stuff, cool non-sci-fi stuff, cool stuff. It's really fun. They're nice people. I like them. Uh, there's going to be tons of sci-fi games to play. We have a whole game room. It's going to be in the entire half of the Davis room. Um, we're going to have a couple of new games for people to try out, which is going to be really fun, and a bunch of your old favorite sci-fi games, because people like old sci-fi games. And new sci-fi games? Games. Enjoy yourselves. Uh, there's going to be cooperative spaceship and airship simulators, so you get your choice, depending on the time of day. Um, there's also the spaceship simulator where you stand in a circle with phones and scream at each other. That's... That is Space Team. It is a time. Um, and at the end of the evening, there's going to be Cantina, which is our big fun dance at the end of the evening. Um, the cantina dance is like your school dance, but better because we are nerds and we don't care if you dance bad. Um, also, we're going to have live music at cantina for the first time, so that's going to be like rad as heck. Um, I think it's rad as heck. And today is the last chance to buy your um, pre register star member price Starfest tickets. If you are a member of Star, if you are a paid member, your ticket is $8 today. You can buy it from Julio after Star, after after uh, Michael Cooper's wonderful mission. Um, it is $8 today if you are a Star member. And if you are not a Star member, don't buy it today for $10. Um, you can also buy tickets at the door, but the price will be increased by $2. So, Please come to Starfest. It is this Saturday. We are working very hard on it. Come to Starfest. Yes? Uh, when does online pre-registration close? Online pre-registration closes uh, this Friday at 6 p.m. So if, also, yeah, you can buy your ticket online at RIT Starfest, starfest.ritstar.com. There are also links to that on um, our Facebook. Also, if you type in RIT Starfest, it's like the first thing that comes up. You can buy your ticket online if that is more convenient for you. Uh, please, buy your ticket to Starfest. Come to Starfest. Come to Starfest. All right, uh, last little quick thing. Um, we also sell sodas, they're a dollar. Um, all the proceeds go to the International Bipolar Foundation. Um, and uh, so, lastly, if you want to go to Starfest, um, talk to Tulio, or go to our go to starfest.ritstar.com. Well, without further ado, handing things off to Michael Cooper for his undoubtedly well-researched mission. Moment. 
So hi, welcome to Games and Science Fiction. So my name is Michael Cooper. Give me a moment to just set up my notes. So what is a game? Uh, that's a question for the audience. Does anyone want to answer that question? A thing that you play. A thing that you play, play that you has rules. And a thing that you just lost. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. I won that game like a decade ago. Yeah? Something you do for fun. Wow. Something you do for fun. Uh, so if I was doing it professionally, would it not be for fun and therefore it wouldn't be a game? Depends. That's whether I enjoy what you're doing. Well, I think it's, well, having studied what is a game by going through all these academic papers, researching it, looking at the works of sociologists, the question is simple and not controversial in the slightest. Just look at all these clear, concise definitions. Uh, all right, and if you're wondering, I'm in between uh, somewhere where something where all systems are games that you have to win and lose, and I do that light switch our video games. <laughs> so now that I've cleared that up, uh, why are games important? Every country has games. Many animals play games, like on their own. Games play an important role in many cultures, and we need to understand what role games play in real life before we can go look at where games play in the role games play in science fiction. And you're going to hear the word play a lot. So why do people play games? Why do you guys play games? They're fun. They're fun? In the back? The fate of the world depends on it. The fate of the world depends on it. Yeah? To do my level design homework. <laughs> I play games in order to grade level design homework. Yeah? To vent frustration. To vent frustration. Because every so often, once in a blue moon, I have time to play a game made by someone else. <laughs> oh, <laughs> every so often, once in a blue moon, yeah. To escapism, to be like something you're not, yes. which is special. All right. Well, there are many excess mental, physical energy, training. Like maybe a lot of games that we play was probably started as simulations for prepared for battles. Like, I do a lot of fencing, and that was originally supposed to be a duel simulation. A, simu a game is dueling, and no one dies while you're practicing. Uh, to encourage a mindset, like a problem-solving mindset. Sharpen your mind, strengthen your muscles, and improve your reflexes. And also distract yourself from the inevitability of death. Yeah. You knew I was going to bring that up. Yeah. Like, we all know this about the game, and the even better game with Bill and Ted, but again, Seth. Who here knows about Bill and Ted, by the way? Sadly, yes. Sadly, it was an excellent movie. It was an excellent movie. Most excellent. Show up on Hogan. I mean, let me remind you, the original plan for the plot was to have them visit at several major points in time, but the beginning of the Titanic and cause us. So, who knows Johan Heisinger? He's going to say. <laughs> well, he's actually he's actually one of the first people to really study games, at least in the West. He identified a play element in culture. So this play element is sort of how culture originated in his point of view. We all take part in these playful exercises, not necessarily games, but playful, game-like. And these and these exercises create culture. This culture is then codified into the laws and traditions. So we start by playing as civilization, and then we end up with civilization. Essentially, he says play creates culture. So what is the play element as he defines it? It's voluntary. No, I'm willing to. Uh, these are a bunch of rules. I'm willing to combat him on a couple of these, but this is a good shorthand for what play is. Life. When you're playing, you're not living your ordinary life, no matter what that means. Like, like imagine if we went about our normal lives the way same way we'd go in a point-and-click adventure. 
by just picking up objects and pointing at stuff and combining it with other stuff. It's madness. It's pretend, just for fun, or maybe it's a ceremonial role. It takes place in its own place at a special time. So they have a start time and an end time, and it's played in the magic circle, and I'm going to get into the magic circle later. Yeah, I'm okay. It creates order through the rules and nature of play that forces consistency among the players. Art-like char art -like characteristics. It has rules. They're binding, but they're freely accepted. You buy into the rules when you play. If you're ch and really enough, according to Johan Heisinga, if you're a cheater, you're still playing by the rules. You need to recognize the rules in order to cheat the rules. If if you're a spoiled board as in someone who refuses to play whatsoever, you're in fact worse than a cheater from his point of view. It has tension, as in you don't know what's going to happen necessarily. It's not set in stone. Once the game starts, anything can happen. That will ever be of the Grandmaster Champion. Physically impossible. And players do not profit materially, though I am going to combat him on this one. It seems like he doesn't think that gambling is real games and real play, and I think it is. But that's his rules. But, uh, yeah? I just want to combat him on the play at the start and end time. He clearly doesn't know about the concept of just one more match. <laughs> right, but it, it's, it's just the idea is that, oh, you start or a new play time, you when, transition into different play times. Or when you you, you lose, like, I can't have a loss, but then he wins, like, oh, I want to keep the win streak going. <laughs> yeah, maybe he should have considered that. Oh, and another thing to point out is that a lot of these are people playing games, but also notice the Shakespeare reenactments. That is also a game from his point of view. Well, it's not a game, but it's, well, of course it's a play, but it's also playful. It's the play. So what is the magic circle? It is the place and time where play happens. It's supposed to be this magical, uh, uh, sacred place. It's not a literal circle. Don't anyone, let anyone tell you it's a literal circle. I mean, sometimes it's a circle, but it doesn't have to be a circle. It could be a playground. It could be any type of arena. It could be a courtroom because law is has a play element. It could be a church because religion has a play element. It could be Congress because politics has a play element. It could be anything. Does anyone have an example that I haven't thought of? You're living there? What do you play in there? Okay. A lot of times it's like Congress and stuff. I have fun in class. Yeah, there is there's rules to the classroom. Uh, there's different strategies and methods in the classroom. There's a play element there. And it's also a special time at a special place. Anyone else? Yeah. Yes. Any conventions? Like, like the SAU is sort of a magic circle for Starfest. It is going to be at the special time, at a special place where people will behave differently than they would at ordinary life. It's, yeah, he stretched this concept a lot, but still a useful idea. Yeah. Imagine you're like you were kind of oval on the back face. Do magic ovals count? No, but the play map does. <laughs> All right, so there's play in law. Courts have rules. There's different kinds of players. There's strategies. There's uh, the courtroom itself is a magic circle. He even identifies three different forms of game play in courtrooms, be it games of chance, contests, as in like a uh, trial by combat. That's a contest. That's one way to handle a legal system. Like it's an approach to justice, but it's one way of handling a legal system. And there's also, of course, a classic verbal battle between the attorney and the prosecutor. Uh, there's play and wars. I mean, everyone describes wars through game metaphors, or do we describe games through war metaphors? Like, there's rules to combat, theoretically, that you can follow. There's strategies to play, there's players, objectives, measurements of success. And the battlefield could be, it's a, a no man's land can be considered a, no, a practical in a sense. And of course, I know it's fantasy, but it's the perfect example. Games and politics, play in politics, it's called Game of Thrones for a reason. So it's basically science fiction. Uh, yeah, sure. 
So, uh, quick question, guys. Does Game of Thrones like, take place in some sort of Dyson sphere, or is that just the opening? This is the opening. Okay. All right, so Hideo Kojima, game designer of Summer Renown. I know Cameron likes Hideo Kojima. Uh, actually wrote a letter to his the about pollutants. Cameron, you want to read it out loud? We find one another and compete with one another. We laugh together and cry together, all while playing together. Our experiences bind us and liberate. Here are our most valuable experiences. We create stories, invent tools, and evolve the art of play. Play has been our ally since the dawn of civilization. <laughs> yeah, that's that's classic Kojima. So games and science fiction, the thing that this presentation is supposed to be about? Uh, well, science fiction depicts cultures. Yeah, and in these cultures, cultures have games. I mean, if you take Heisenberg's point of view and games create, and play creates culture, well, play creates culture, well, culture itself can create games as well. And science fiction itself is a cultural artifact. And it's a cultural artifact that have, contains cultural artifacts <coughs> within it. So we have games within science fiction that's cultural artifact inside of cultural artifacts. I could be academic. So let's first look at games as motifs in storytelling. Does anyone here remember what a motif is? Yeah? Hey, repeat the element. With symbolic meaning. So the point is that these games have symbolic meaning within the within the uh, science fiction work. So games uh, have ex we have a shared experience when it comes to games. We all know what chess is, right? So if I were to say, we all know what chess is, right? Yeah. <laughs> so if I were to say, knight takes rook, you guys would know what I'm talking about, right? So there's a shared experience. There's also a shared understanding. When I say knight takes rook, you understand what I mean. If I also put a pawn, you would know what I mean by that. Because pawns have symbolic experience and we understand it. When I say describe someone as a pawn, I'm saying that they are being manipulated and controlled and that they're cannon fodder. It helps get ideas across quickly because they're like a common symbolic face. You don't need to explain the symbolism of a chess set. And the audience can understand the game-based metaphors and analogies that we create. I mean, take for instance chess. Now this is the opening scene of the first episode of Star Trek aired. I, I know it's not the first episode of Star Trek, it's the first one aired. It's not the one of Captain Mike. Can we make it louder, please? Yeah, come on in. It's been accepted by now. Bird said they call. I'll have you checkmated. at your next move. <laughs> have I ever mentioned you play a very irritating game of chess, Mr. Spock? Irritating? Ah, oh, yes. One of your earthly motions. <laughs> Certainly you don't know what irritation is? One of my ancestors married a human female. Terrible. I think bad blood like that. <laughs> so, so that, that's our chess. It's 3D chess, but we still are trying to. What does it tell us about Captain Kirk? He's human. He's human? What else? Well, I think it tells us why he's at a big miracle. Well, I think it tells us why he's a captain and not Spock, even though Spock is clearly smarter and is apparently more logical than Kirk. Because though Spock, though Spock probably can compute better in his mind, he is quite on science on itself, he didn't get a sense of the board that Kirk has. And Kirk has the ability to just make miracles happen, and Spock is just there to sort of like, Spock doesn't have that same ability. And also when we talk about, what about when Kirk describes Spock as playing an irritating game of chess? What does that mean? And he's very, he's doing a very methodical and, like, 
He knows what to expect, but just because he knows what to expect doesn't mean he can counter it. Maybe. Well, yeah. Uh, I think we more that Fox method is playing is or by some argument is not playing, it's just taking the most efficient path to the outcome he believes he should try to reach, and not necessarily one that makes the experience fun. Possibly, maybe he's not thinking outside the box. Well, obviously, this is foreshadowing their future romance. <laughs> All right, anyone here watch the original Blade Runner? The director's cut of the original. <laughs> no, the uh, special edition of the director's cut of the original. Uh, the second version of that. On VHS. On VHS. Oh, but, then, uh, but then, uh, converted to Blu-ray. What about LaserDisc? Oh, no, Michael, what about LaserDisc? LaserDisc? Yeah, no, not that version. Okay. That version is just, like, nonsense. <laughs> Alright, so, I'm not gonna spoil it, though, but there's a point where the replicants, Sebastian and Tyrell, play a game of chess. Sebastian wins because, as a replicant, he is much smarter and, and stronger than a physical human. Well, I don't know why physical strength would help you with a chess match, but you get the idea. But the game replicates the immortal game. It's a, one of the classic games of chess. Called, I will simply live on an in infamy. And it involves sacrificing both rogues, a bishop, and a queen. Just a lot of insane sacrifices that somehow pull out a win at the very end. Making it just a magnificent game to watch. It's just a sudden turnaround. Or at least so I told, I'm not that into chess. And do you think it's coincidence? They play just missed. Well, I can tell you for sure it was coincidence. But to the death of the offer, it's fun to speculate. It also it means that there's the replicants. Like this game clearly shows that. Alright, who here watched 2001 A Space Odyssey? Right. Does anyone remember the scene where Hal and Dr. Frank Poole are playing a game of chess? Does anyone know that Hal makes an error? So, what does it mean for Hal to make an error? Something wrong with yeah. the program. It's foreshadowing Hal's crazier decisions later in the film. Maybe. What we call this how was testing, how just outright says, I'm going to beat you in two turns and I'm going to describe why. He describes it wrongly, but because it was being described by a computer, maybe he was just testing to see if Frank Poole will confirm with him, will confirm whether it's actually that, or will he will just blindly trust the computer as part of his psychological examination of the whole proof. There's also one other possibility. Kubrick made a mistake. But that seems unlikely for some reason. Yeah. Rick Shaw took 157 takes to shoot. But how did this movie? No, that was in The Shining. This in The Shining? Oh. Was really? Like, this shot? Like, no, no, no. Uh, there was a shot in The Shining which he refused to take as, as is because he wanted it to be perfect, quote unquote. And because he believed every single scene was a masterpiece of its own. Yeah, that's why his actors always get traumatized. Yeah. And also, do you know what this game also means? It means that Kubrick faked the moon landings. So no, we that's just, The Shining! Oh, right, that's The Shining. Because that's the one isn't the one that tells us that. So as I mentioned before, chess pieces uh, represent stuff. So if I were to describe a unit as a pawn, if I were to describe a person as a pawn, that would mean that they're disposable, being manipulated. If they're knights, it means that they're brave and also disposable. If they're queen, they're probably indispensable, and they're also valuable to the ally. And king is, of course, the leader. There's, of course, also the chess master archetype. He's great at plans, manipulative, thinking ahead. Because he thinks only to chess metaphors, people think he's smart. Also, just one thing about this guy. Uh, can we, how do I turn off the light here? Uh, there's a small detail about this guy's design that I need you guys to see. Look at his, look at his contact lenses. Why? I don't know. Does anyone here actually remember the show The Cape? 
One person. Two person. Two people. Three if you count me. Yeah, it was this old NBC superhero show where he's the villain. Does anyone want to know what his name is? You know, get guess his name. His name is just Chess. Yeah. People just call him Chess. That's <laughs> It's the only thing I really remember about the show. I don't even remember the cape. I just remember this guy. Yes, there was a cape in the show. I confirmed that there was a cape in the show. There's also like poker metaphors you can find in fiction. Like, this is, of course, uh, the crew of the Voyager playing poker. And do you want to know how hard it would be to beat these guys at poker? Data is an android who can perfectly calculate every probability. Uh, Troy is an empath who can, though she can't read your mind, she can read your emotions and tell if you're bluffing. At least that's theoretically what she can do. And everyone else here is just smart, starfleet people anyway. So do you think you could beat any of them? Well, I guess there's always a chance. Is that why uh, yeah. is, uh, is that why Data is the dealer? Yeah, you're too good. <laughs> yeah, because Data would necessarily be well this isn't blackjack, so he wouldn't necessarily be able to count cards that way, but <laughs> All right. Who here has ever played Dungeons and Dragons? Has or has? Has. Oh. If you haven't, uh, have you played any other tabletop role play game? Like maybe Traveler? Yeah, Traveler, that's the one that came to my head. Pathfinder. Pathfinder, yeah, Pathfinder. Well, if you haven't played a tabletop game, uh, you're in college, it's your job to fix that. Anyway, um, in Stranger Things, it starts with the four kids playing Dungeons and Dragons. And of course, their adventure Dungeons and Dragons perfectly foreshadow what happens next, because why else would you have Dungeons and Dragons in your TV show? Because it's fucking awesome. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. It's awesome because it's foreshadowing. So a lot of you're Well, yeah. I'll be it. This show is technically before, takes place after both my parents this time. Anyway, uh, that's the Demogorgon, well at least it's the feature you can represent the Demogorgon, and that's a monster in D&D. It's also what they call the monster uh, from someplace else, the downside. That's what, what was it called in? Upside down. The upside down. It's also what they call a monster because what else would you name it? And weirdly enough, uh, the roles the, the players play in the game sort of mimic the roles they play in over the course of the TV show. That's another subtle detail there. Albeit, the moment I saw the Dungeons and Dragons thing, I just knew this game of Dungeons and Dragons will foreshadow everything. Because, you know, it's a story. So, does anyone else know any other game of teams? Were you saying a team again? A symbol, essentially. No. Oh. Yeah? Risk and Battleship were both used as a military tactic before they became game. game. So that's all we choose to have the basic medical Yeah. Okay. So the fact they played Battleship in the movie Battleship. Yeah, they played Battleship in the movie Battleship. They used tsunami detectors for the heads. Or like they used tsunami to correct the, the points on the board, and then the monster, the aliens' missiles were shaped at all the heads. <laughs> so it's like, the movie was so stupidly stupid. Yeah. But fun. So. Games for world building. What is world building? Can anyone answer that? Anyone here from Fantasy Club who can answer that? Yeah? What is world building? Yes. So that is creating the entire universe that your characters leave, live and breathe and you know, interact with. It's creating what their emotion, emotions are. It's creating what their incentives are. Why they are doing things. It's creating the external forces that are going on. In, in, you know, shaping the magic, the lore, the history, the you know, fauna, the plants, the you name it, because everything about it. Cool. Yeah, that's a great answer. I'm going to mainly be looking at games as they are sort of like background details to help build up the sense of a lived in place. Uh, what J.R. Tolkien described as secondary world is sort of like what he said a consistent, <laughs> coherent place to set stories in. So, 
since worlds have culture in them, like generally they have culture, has anyone imagined a science fiction world that where there isn't a culture? Games are products of culture, and culture is also a product of games. So we can believe in a fictional world if it has some games. That's six hours. So this game is Star Wars, it's called Jet Cedric. And each piece is an alien in Star Wars Galaxy, and each piece has their own article in the Wikipedia. Has anyone ever went to the Wikipedia? Yes. It, it's a monster. It's always as big as the Wikipedia. I don't understand. Anyway, because the Falcon has this game, it feels like a place people would actually live. Like maybe during a long uh, run, even though in Star Wars all ships move at the speed of plot, maybe you can play this game to pass the time. You said all stars just move to see a Thoughts. Thoughts, yes. Yes. <laughs> Very accurate. So we're not accurate. It has three to three. <laughs> so, do you know Dendrick has its own history? Do you know that the center of a game called Shaztes? Oh, it's a game uh, where uh, it's an abstract strategy game where there's two players, they take turns, and they move uh, different pieces uh, on a turn based wood board. And each piece, and different pieces have different styles of movement. It's a lot like chess. In fact, chess descended from Shaztes, according to Star Wars, which means that in Star Wars, chess exists. Yes. Also, Darth Sidious is a fan. Yeah? Yeah, here he's also called Hollow Chess, so maybe that's probably Chess actually. Maybe, it would make sense. Yes, but Lord Sidious himself says that, that Chess exists in the world. Probably It's actually, yeah, that's one of the ones. Yeah. What about the software tool works, Star Wars Chess? A computer game made by the software tool works, which is like our Chess, except every piece is a Star Wars character. That depends. Does it take, is it a game made inside the Star Wars world? Is it a diegetic game? So, Darth Sidious plays chess, and I think we all know that Darth Plagueis plays Go. Alright, so it's Star Wars of many, many cultures, and each culture has their own game that reflects them. Let's start with the Klingons. So, the Klingons. Uh, are warlike, they find that honor is most important, and they care a lot about traditions. So a lot of their games are actually framed as rituals, uh, which according to Johan Heisinger, who alluded, is still playful, it's still play, it's still games. So there's one that's sort of, uh, I'm terrible at pronouncing Klingon words, but Fock Will, and that is an arm wrestling challenge. Uh, there's other games about training and historical reenactments. And War Pieces Calisthenics, where he spikes the ancient enemies of the Klingons uh, as a way of training himself for future combat encounters. So, a warlike traditional warrior culture race would have games that reflect traditions, rituals, and combat. The Ferengi are ultra capitalists. Uh, they believe greed is good, profit is cause, and as such, a lot of their games focus on gambling or on simulations of the economy. So Davo is a roulette style game. I don't know the special rules for it, but I do know it can be rigged, which makes sense. Like, it makes sense for a variety to break a roulette game. Congo is a combination of roulettes, cards, and for some reason, Monopoly. And the goal is to make as much as possible, so it's the economy, essentially. Each shirt's each turn the player can confront, he may acquire a retreat from a venture, and each venture has a risk, a buy amount, and a sell amount. So it's all about selling stocks because that is what Ferengi find. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Vulcans. Vulcans are super logical. They feel that logic is very important to them. So a lot of their games are based on strategy and computation. Like they're known for their and Alto is this game here, where you have a mess of rods, and you need to make time into make it into a perfect sphere. And for some reason, there's magnets, gravitation, a lot of complicated, complicated stuff that apparently makes this game hard. But you see, Vulcans also have another another weirder part of their culture. The Pond Bar. Who here knows what the Pond Bar is? 
know, every seven years, both can suffer on chemical balance and result in extreme lust. Uh, in this period, uh, if they're not satiated, they die. Because that, that's just a good, that's just how species evolve in Star Trek. Like, you know the part of natural selection that, you know, gives an advantage to people who die every seven years if they don't mate. Anyway, one way to avoid that is to caliphate. Uh, caliphate is a ritual where two males uh, fight over the right to marry a female. And this is very weird for Vulcans, because one, why would such a logical race uh, focus so much on traditions instead of when it should be based on pure logic? Well, there's a lot of theories about why a, tradi why a logic based race would care about traditions. And also, this represents sort of like the opposite of what they were before. This is a period, whenever this happens, they have a period of essentially extreme emotion, or it's almost to make up for all the times they try to suppress their emotions later on in life. And they use games, even though it's a deadly game, as a way of sort of uh, dealing with their emotions when the time comes. And of course, there's Tutskata, Tutskate. I'm not sure how to pronounce this. Anyway, this is, a, this is introduced in an episode of Voyager, where multiple species fight in a series of one-on-one -on -one arts matches, one-on-one -on -one martial arts matches. And this also introduces the rock to the world. Yeah? <laughs> the rock made tech, and no one told you? And as of course, this is what made him famous. This is what made him popular. <laughs> this is what introduced him to America. That is probably a wrestling career. All right, and here's another one from Futurama. All right, please load. There we go. I'm starting to get the hang of this game. Because the worms are loaded, the counts three worms and two anti worms, and the infield worm rule to the back, right? Except for the word worm, that was complete gibberish. <laughs> Why is it pixelated? Oh, that's the other win condition. The first one being catch the snitch. Yeah. Not die more. Oh, where's my mouse? Right there. So, are there any like games played in the background of science fiction works that you've always wanted to play? 3D chess. Like 3D chess, yeah. That's a real. Is it 3D? I actually made my own. You want to talk about it later? I played it, it was fun. Uh, my also favorite is 3D Tic Tac Toe, but that was like made before uh, Star Trek, actually. My dad has an old word copy of it that I played in it. It's pretty fun, actually. You know, checkmate, not checkmating, a winning in three dimensions. See anything else? There's not, there's not really in the background, but I've been trying. Hard Wars? Card Wars. Card Wars. Oh. You, can, you can buy a ball club of them playing it in the episode, but it's actually like if chess crosses with like, like, uh, well, it's not really chess. It's, it's like a, it's like a very tiny version of like Yu-Gi-Oh or something. Yeah, they have like holograms. Yeah. All right. So, of course, another thing is that games can be used as a plot device directly. It's not just world building. It can become an integral part of the plot. So why is that the case? Games? Well, because games are so arbitrary, but we accept them as arbitrary. Like, if I were to say two people are fighting in a practice sparring match and none of them dies, you can accept that because it's a sparring match. If, 
if it's a game of skill determining wealth, I mean, poker goes by very arbitrary rules. But if you win a game of poker, like the audience will accept, they know what the rules of poker are. And because they also have clear measurements of success, and all the times it's easy to tell who's winning and who's losing, that means that it's easy to give the audience attention, again, without having to outline some elaborate battlefield or trying to come up with some super serious idea or trying to come up with some world ending stakes. And even though games are played for some fun, it's sort of like fun taken seriously. That's what a game is. And it's easy to understand for the audience. So we have some epic duels here. So duels being a conflict between two individuals with arbitrary rules. Like this is just outright combat. They just want to kill each other. But other duels they try to follow instead of rules, where they still try to kill each other, but they're trying to kill each other by the book. So who here remembers the fight between Neo and Morpheus? Who here watched The Matrix? Uh, I am recording all your answers, so you know. Yeah? No. All right, so for those who don't know, in The Matrix, it takes place in a virtual world where the inhabitants don't know it's virtual. The wall has been pulled over their eyes, and they've been tricked into thinking that what is actually a virtual world is the real world. But those who realize the true nature of the world can accomplish a magnificent feats and basically have superpowers because they can sort of see the code, which is literal code because it's a virtual world. So in this fight, Neo knows this is a fictional, this is a fictional, virtual, uh, a fictional virtual world, but he doesn't, his body still doesn't really accept it yet. Like, it's sort of like you're strapped into a roller coaster ride, you know you're not going to fall out, but you still get vertigo. So, so this is the idea is to practice looking at the world in a new way, in a hard way to look at it. So Morpheus is essentially sparring with him, trying to encourage him to think, think it's possible for him. It's, so eventually, he knows Kung Fu. Well, that's what he says, I expect you guys would laugh at that. Uh, knowing it is a simulation grants him the powers to understand it. And who hears, I assume most of us saw Black Panther at this point. Mm -hmm. Panther, the king, a kingship and the mantle of the Black Panther is determined by winning a duel once the previous king <laughs> dies, or once the other previous king uh, abdicates his throne. So those who win this very game-like, playful exchange will become king. Uh, <laughs> <sure>. What? <laughs> You think not you, playful. That's playful. It's play in the way Homo it's play in the way outlined in Homo Ludens. People can die. Besides, the implication is that people rarely do die doing this. Most people uh, yield. Yeah. yield. Alright, games can also be used for training. The idea is that you can run through some intense scenario, like a combat scenario in a game. And then when you do it in real life, it's muscle memory. You don't need to think about it. You don't need to, and you're less likely to panic. So it's just like a simulation? Yeah, it's just like a simulation. So, in Ender's <laughs> game, there's a battle room. The battle room isn't there to actually teach you about real world combat. I don't think this is how combat works in the Ender's game universe. But it's there to train your mind for strategic thinking and also thinking in zero G. So, this takes place in a this takes place in a space station, and this room is essentially zero G. And your goal is to get one of your people down to the other side, this A here, while the other team is trying to get one of their players to your base, base B. So because this is zero G, uh, you can either think of it as the other base is in front of you, or you can think of it as the other base is below you. And you could just need to move downwards. It's actually very clever how he does this. And who here, uh, has, who here has followed the theory that the older multiplayer and all the Halo games is just part of simulations of uh, their train program? I mean, it's just theorized in the machine of Red versus Blue. But here, yeah? The Halo 4 and 5 is canon. Oh, yeah. That's also the, the prevailing six siege. That uh, the TPE is real, like you're fighting other operators, is a simulation. And that's supported by the book, 
in which there is a brief part of a chapter in which some people from the Rainbow Six have a simulation against each other. Is that why characters seem to jump from the terrorists and then come to the terrorist side? Well, it's all like counter terrorists, but yeah, it's like all that stuff. Also, if you have one, just boot you, so. Yeah. So the X Men has this place called the Danger Room. In the Danger Room, it's sort of this holographic display where they fight and train and learn to work together. Uh, in this game called Freedom Force, a. Someone here played Freedom Force? <laughs> that makes me so happy. Uh, anyway. So it's a superhero strategy game, and it's all now made by a rational game. So this is what they made before they made Bioshock. Yes. There was things. There's many things before Bioshock. <laughs> anyway, these heroes makes a team. These heroes become heroes by a mysterious energy X Men, if you would. Anyway, they have a place in. In their headquarters called the Danger Room. So these also these energy X Men fight as a team in the Danger Room, and Marvel never complained about this. They never complained about this. People don't kill our competition. All right, who here has watched an anime with a tournament dark? I haven't because I don't really watch the anime, but I've heard good, I've heard things about it. I mean, that's only like in like. Battle anime, which is only like 45% of it, and most of it's not that good. Lego has a tournament arc. Lego Ninja. It's actually not terrible. Most, most tournament arcs are actually decent. Well, the idea of a tournament arc is that you can get a good battle of the week system where every week will just be a battle between two people, and these two people could be newly introduced characters, it could be mashups of characters that we've always watched see fight. They can have diverse skill set. That is a good way of basically. Uh, it's a good excuse to basically have action. And between matches, you can get into the other characters like those, those guys trying to figure out whether Jackie Chun and Master Roshi are one of the same, or or find out now. People. I don't know which specific anime you're talking about, but it sounds like Well, like current. Dragon Ball Super iteration on the series. Yeah, one. So this also follows into the idea of a hero's journey. Because if, if you're looking at a hero's journey, there's always a part of it where the hero must go through trials. Well, one of the trials can be a game. That's a good way to add variety. I mean, sometimes it doesn't always have to be deadly stakes, but even if games have deadly stakes, they can have special rules and you can have an audience watch them. Their love interest can watch for the balcony and support them. Yeah, it's a great way to just add one more trial. So, of course, there's one classic example of this, a classic example, pod racing. <laughs> this is pod racing. So what purpose did pod racing serve in Star Wars? Yeah? Time filler. Time filler. And to sell toys. To sell toys, but also to sell the technology, yeah? That thing goes on that one thing. <laughs> the entire plot was all an excuse to make that one visual gag work. Yes, yes. Look, he's key to all of us. He's the key. He's the key to all of us. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the fifth video that so. In the back? It was the base one of the greatest arcade games ever off of. That was a great arcade game. It was yeah. a great arcade game. What about N64, PlayStation, and PC? Yeah. Yes, the arcade version is so much better because it is in the pod. It is. Oh, that's true. Don't you, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Better than Connect Star Wars. But you know, the unusual <laughs> like story artistic reason for this stuff as well. It's there to basically show that Anakin Skywalker has strength with the Force, and it's also there to prove himself. This is sort of how Anakin Skywalker threshold the threshold from slave to uh, hero, and that's an important part of the hero's journey. It's basically his start as well. Yeah. Mentioned is certainly the best star pilot of the galaxy. Or is that when he when he flew around in that spaceship? The the, <laughs> the, the one where he tried spinning. Cause that's a good trick. Spinning is a good trick, actually. Just like Star Fox is spinning is a good trick. All right. 
And since we're working in science fiction, science fiction asks, why not? I mean, why did? So if we have this, what games can be made with this? So we have zero G sports. Uh, this is a clever one where it's inside a centrifuge that with a pool that is in the shape of a ring because it's in a centrifuge. I, is, no, is it theoretically possible for this pool to happen? You would get so sick. <laughs> where it's sci-fi poster. Unless it's a huge thing. Yeah. If, if you're working at a low like here, uh, what's that game where what's that Olympic sport where you have to run and you have a pike and you have to pull like, pole pull it? Well you can pull both in incredibly high heights. Actually, I actually heard somewhere that depending on where you are on Earth, because of very subtle variances in the gravity depending on places on Earth, because the Earth is in a place spheroid. Uh, pole vaulting in different areas is either easier or harder. True. Not by a lot, but I believe as much as a centimeter or something like that. We have no one. No, is that still a variable science? Yeah. A centimeter is in pole vaulting, but that sounds reasonable. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, kind of bring my like real world game. I know they have to, like, I guess, like NFL, or any you know, like open sport game, where they, when they play in Denver, um, they have to like actually acclimate to the altitude. And inversely, um, people from Denver will have an easier time playing a sport than Lawrence do because they're used to a thinner atmosphere. So it could be. It sort of reminds me of the 2012 debate between Barack Obama and Mitt Romney. Where Barack Obama was not showing his A game, and everyone thought that maybe that's because Barack Obama was feeling sick because of the altitude. <laughs> yeah. So, where you feel World Cup in this field, there was a uh, specific soccer field that was in the Amazon rainforest, and I think it was also higher elevation. So, people get really, really tired when they play that period, and most teams that played there lost their nerve. Interesting. All right, the hollow deck. So the holodeck is a Star Trek technology where you use holographic technology in order to recreate a space. Uh, now, I know what you're thinking. What's stopping you from walking into a wall? And I still don't know. What's stopping anyone in the holodeck from walking into a wall? Good yeah. Jared. Oh, okay, so the, the holodeck combines a bunch of different technologies that already exist on Star Ship. Uh, it's able to use the replicator to create things that characters need to stay interactive when they get close enough. You generate the and the force fields out of these just feel solid. And so it's able to create, you're basically walking on like a giant uh, holographic treadmill. And so you don't hit the wall because you haven't actually gone anywhere. And when characters move to different areas, it basically just segments the holodeck. There's a whole thing on this in the Star Trek. I see the visual trail. So two characters walk and meet each away from each other. They really haven't, but all of us make it look like they're actually looking at an image of what they would have appeared like if they actually were 100 meters away. Yeah, so it's, it's a combination of optical uh, uh, replicating and atomizing things that characters that need to have proper physical properties and creating force fields to have just surfaces that control the, the character's movement or the, 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 the player's movement in the holographic world. Cool. Combined with a big enough room can happen and they can spread out and still have the walls. Okay, that I guess that could work. So of course, this being Star Trek, nothing ever goes wrong in the hall. Nothing <laughs> ever goes wrong in the hall deck. Like all Star Trek is perfectly safe. Well, I just like What I'm saying is, I doubt, I'm sure we're going to have less fatalities you know, where we're going to be That's what you said. The whole matter is the people inside it. It's done that. Good programming? Good programming. There's a safe.
the user ID color like uh, bullets from active email to achieve people. They are if you turn off the safeties, then you get bad things happening. Why is people getting <laughs> Well, the holographs are in the lightning count. If the safety use protocols aren't there, all this mass is before. So we should just reduce it. All right, let's, let's enough science in the science fiction club. <laughs> so the dream of VR one day is to recreate the holodeck. And I've seen a lot of efforts to try to do this. Just people wearing the VR headsets, walking around a room. Of course, it doesn't have all the technology that you outlined. Three, three dimensional. Yeah, well, there's a special treadmill, but it's not room it's for multiple users walking in different directions, yes. Oh, like, it's not really possible, but it's there to show what can be done with the new technology of the time. That's that's why it's wrong. Here played uh, Armageddon. Maybe I didn't check. Yeah, why don't we? We should. I'll beat you though. Challenge accepted. And Darwinia. Has anyone here played Darwinia? Of course, the game developer has played Darwinia. The Darwinia was the first indie game to come. So, like, decades ago. And it's about a card that is home to the Darwinians. The Darwinians are these AI. To essentially a natural selection style process. Each you can visit these, they can interact you can interact with them, they can interact with you. You and this whole and this whole simulation acts as, like I said, a digital union mark. Unfortunately, they didn't update their antivirus software. And now and that's why this is a game. Your game is to sit the audience from a virus that they accidentally download. So there's also games within games, which I'm counting as sort of like a subplot within a plot. So these are games. So when you're playing a very long game, it's useful to have a mini game that breaks us up the pacing. So these can include an arena mini game, a mini game played on the Pip Boy in uh, Fallout Four. Yeah, I'm assuming that's intentional. They have like. They have like gone simple because the idea is that the world is still around you. So while you're playing this game, you should like be attacked by death, I guess. Yes. There's a mod that just spots death claws behind you whenever. No, it, it, it's literally um, the longer you look at the pit boys, it do. And of course, there's one mini game that I thought about. Blitzball. Oh, I think 10, but that says sci fi elements. Basically. What about Grip Ball? Grip Ball. Oh, yeah, now I know Grip Ball. So, this is underwater basketball. Don't ask me how that works. Don't ask me how they hold the breath. Uh, Oxygenated water. <laughs> yeah. Because ten years later, I still can't figure it out. Uh, well, you see, there's only one point where you have to play it, uh, and you can lose. Yeah. Um, what about the side quest conversion to pre sequel where you have to set a basketball dunking record and go on the fire? You don't have to be on fire, <laughs> but you want to be on fire. You should try that challenge in real life. Uh, anyway, like I said, we can all uh, we can all like agree that Final Fantasy X is basically science fantasy, right? Right? You are all not going to combat me on that. I mean, most fire versions of these are. Yeah. So you're not going to combat me on this, but will you combat me on this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. This one is definitely fantasy. It's Witcher's. Can be treated like that, yeah? I will contend that The Witcher is about a sci-fi Star Wars. Ooh. 
Yeah. I mean, both like I mean, the the both the like uh, does deal with um, parallel universes and Confluence of the spheres. It's, yeah, it's, it's we're going like, conjunction of the spheres. Yeah, when the human world crosses the monster world, it's it's a foolish fantasy. I know. So, so the way when it works is essentially, oh yeah, and if you guys just can't really accept me talking about Gwent in a science fiction club, uh, that's the old Republic had bizarre which is another card game that you collect cards in, in the game world. So uh, Pizak is basically uh, it's some form of competitive blackjack. Um, it's, it's, it's OK, I guess. Anyway, the point of these in-game card games is that you collect these cards inside the games, and the people inside the games recognize that these cards exist and will play you on it. So diegetically speaking, you're walking up to someone in the world and saying, I want to play a game. And you can play Pizak, you can play Gwent with them. Yeah. I know uh, at least probably Vegas have big caravan. Oh yeah, I forgot to put caravan on there. Yeah, you you cut cards in the game. You, you know, like most people, like most vendors, you say, Oh, play here wanna play a game of caravan? Yeah, they could have cards, so yeah. So not only are these not only is it fun because you get these cards as rewards for quests instead of rewards for loot boxes. Or I think you can actually uh, at least for like the Witcher, you can actually like determine whether or not you can get information on someone by, by beating them in the game of Grand or game of Caravan. <laughs> yeah, I believe that's a side quest. And they're cheaper than the real thing. Like, they're cheaper than just buying a deck of cards. They're already in the game. And because. Or. Card game. Why is that? Ryan here? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, why isn't he here? Do you feel like you're part of a community when you play Magic? I haven't played it. <laughs> like, you're part of something greater than yourself. You're going to this place, there's a whole community of Magic players. You play this game, you can take part in tournaments, you're, you're discussing Magic with your friends, you're part of something. Well, if you're doing the same thing in a game or with Gwent or with Kazak or with Caravan, then you're basically becoming part of the world as well. It's great world building. So, uh, there's also the course you know, help I am trapped in a game. <laughs> this is sort of an extension of the trapped inside of Old Genre, so it's very much like Wonderland. Alice in Wonderland. And all the time when you die in the game, you die in real life. Yeah? Same thing goes for getting grounded and calling customer service. <laughs> I don't know that reference to I don't get it. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, so in these stories, like, it's a good way of getting people in mortal danger while still ha while having arbitrary rules and getting the audience to accept it because they already know this. That is ridiculous. Examples here. In Spy Kids 3D Game Over, <laughs> who here remembers that movie? I, know. Oh. I saw it in the theater with a 3D glass. Well, did, you, did you guys remember the Sylvester Stallone's in it? Yeah. Yeah. Do you guys remember that Elijah Wood is in it? Oh, yeah. And you know the guy, and you know who Elijah Wood plays? He plays the one. He plays the guy. And he dies when you close the door. Yeah? Game over. Try again. Yeah, I remember they, they, you're selling you 3D glasses. The first part of the movie is the villain of the first movie telling you how 3D glasses work. Also, Khan is in it. Khan is in it? She's the grandfather, you can see. Grandfather, he's down in the corner. Also, don't forget about the machete. Yeah, Mache I like the machete is in there. And it's machete. It's the same universe. Five same universe. Yeah. So in this classic movie that no one is at all embarrassed about, uh, a, a villain called the Toy Master was trapped inside of virtual reality. Was trapped inside virtual reality, 
uh, because of his villainy, and he puzzles the plan to his PR video game. And that's all I remember from this. It's better than the four. It's better than what? Uh, I, I, I forgot yeah. there was a four. Yeah. <laughs> we <laughs> all <laughs> forgot that there was a four. I think it was a third DVD thing. Oh, yeah. No, it wasn't. What? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's. Does anyone remember the scene where Sylvester Stallone is talking to three other Sylvester Stallones? <laughs> and he was a pretty lovely guy. It was the best. Is the third yeah. science fiction? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But it's not like No, it's almost like a fancy story with a science fiction theme. Yeah. Yeah, yes. Like Star Wars, which is space fantasy. No, but in Star Wars, like it's all about space, and there's like technology, and the technology is technology. Here, it's just magic. It's like all the movies. Well, it's like, it's like, it's like a teleporter. Is there a we don't know that. Well, it doesn't I, tell us. So you think that this is an alien conspiracy? No, I didn't say that at all. I'm saying he might well, be a sci-fi box that might have teleported them to a random location. But well, why did the box even come into existence? Oh, oh, I remember that the movie is actually not bad. Yeah, it's not bad. It's, 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 really, yeah. it's pretty good. It's, it's better than I All right, and of course, the classic SAO bridge. The bridge is better than the real thing. This, but it's the real thing. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, that is true. That is true. That is the actual That's real true. one. Yes. Yeah. Well, and SAO bridge, players are trapped inside a VR MMORPG. If they take on the headset, they die. If they die in the game, they die. Uh, they're currently being fed uh, by a tube in the real world. They're stuck in there for years. <laughs> and the out is if they beat the game. Yeah, it's a pretty clever comedy. I, I really liked it. Like, <laughs> like, I hear that someone might be making a elongated version of this. I, I did that game. It was kind of weird that they called this show a bridge. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I think I've read the elongated version. Called Ready Player One. <laughs> <laughs> How did they forget to put that in this presentation? Did you get it? Yeah, I forgot. Oh, wow. How? I remember two in the present. So uh, there's also this episode of Black Mirror. I haven't seen season four. Uh, where you, someone is set to play test a virtual reality game that's supposed to feel very realistic and it's a horror game. And this being a Black Mirror episode, nothing goes wrong. No. Nothing goes wrong. Are you being sarcastic? No. Yes. No. Nothing goes wrong. <laughs> uh, okay, so you're going to So why do these stories resonate? Well, I guess it sort of like is the conflict. It's the marvel of new innovations, but also the fear of new innovations. Uh, it's a bit of wish for women, though. Well, we like good at playing games, even though most of you are not. And uh, therefore, we think that we're uniquely qualified to survive these games, even though most of you will not. I I'm good, I'm fine, but you guys, sorry. So we're going to talk about Death Games. Uh, don't worry, I'm not going to show any actually horrific imagery. So Death Games, I, I originally ran a presentation like this for the Philosophy Club, Philosophy and Games. So they asked me, how do you treat a game like Saw in the Homo Ludens model? Well, it sort of violates the rules because it's not voluntary. Uh, the idea is to put the game players through mortal danger while still retaining the arbitrary rules of games. If the player fails, they'll probably die. Probably. So in Saw, and no pictures, I'm not putting any pictures from Saw. Uh, Jigsaw punishes people for personal failings. They put them in these death games. The idea is that you have to fight your personal failings in order to survive the death game, usually through some form of self mutilation. Yeah? I can actually argue that it is voluntary because they could just choose not to participate and then they'll be dead, but they are participating to try to survive. So it is somewhat voluntary. I should have made that argument to Philosophy Club. <laughs> and the survivors are apparently supposed to come out as. Better people, I guess. Who here thinks that being put in a death game would make them better people by the end? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Game practice is more of a genetic field. More of a genetic field? Hey. 
Yeah. There's also another death game. Yeah. Yeah. What is your death game if it isn't centered around the number nine? Like, is it even a death game? I mean, we so like, have nine <laughs> doors. We have special bracelets. We have special doors. We have a kid for you. Yes. What? And so, and gas masks. Always the people wearing gas masks. Anyway, no spoilers, no spoilers. I'm not going to say that. You need either all that or a uh, a lot of the rules of the game, of the people involved in the game, and the reasons for the games are spoilers that I'm not going to get into. Uh, but the basic set of the game is that they are nine people, nine persons, and they're trapped within a air maze where they have to open nine doors. So there's nine endings. And it, there's six endings. I was making, yeah, okay. Sorry. I was making a joke. And in order to escape within the timeline of nine hours, because they just love the number nine. And do you want to know why it's called 999? Because if you flip 999 upside down, it becomes 666, the number of the beast. Yeah, anyway, really. so it doesn't have anything to do with Shane Adams' movie, Nine, which came out on September 9th, 2009. So, I will say that the reason for the game has to do with the decisions made during the game. Yeah, that's all I'll say. <laughs> There's also this other death game called Dag and Ropa. Have not played this game. Moving on. There's three of them. Oh. All right. Can yeah, anyone else describe Dag and Ropa? Yeah, in the back. So without going to the basics is you take uh, you take people and you trap them in a place, either a school or an island, or those are the ones we have to part of. And, and the rule is. Uh, you, uh, uh, they're just stuck there for indefinitely, and if someone kills someone, then everyone else has to investigate, they hold a trial. If they find the right person, that person is executed. If they find the wrong person, everyone is executed except the killer, and the killer gets to go free. It's a, it's a very much of the prisoner's dilemma, like, mixed with anime, and then some people that are really addicted to the fair. Yeah, it's the crazy is it's yeah, weird. Yeah, yeah. 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 is more virtue class than war. Yeah. So, Battle Royales. Battle Royales are a genre of story, essentially, and also a new genre of games. Like, has anyone here played uh, Player Unknown's Battlegrounds? I mean, you have. Do you mean Fortnite? Do you mean Minecraft of your games? Woo! Oh, jeez! <laughs> <mean, laughs> oh, jeez! <laughs> Yeah, so the idea is that it's a free for all battle that lasts as long as it needs until there's one player and it's set in an open arena, often a natural arena, uh, where players have chances to hide, camouflage, and come up with strategies for how to kill each other. And it's often serves some weird societal purpose. Like the Hunger Games. Yeah. Let's start with the Battle Royale movie. Oh, yeah, I have not actually seen the movie, but here's the synopsis. Battle cheeseburger? What? <laughs> Battle cheeseburger. Battle royale cheese. Battle royale cheese. <laughs> 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 you know, this has a laser pointer. I can point this at your eye. Do not. I'm not. I'm going to point at my eye and glue it to the right one. I don't care about that one. Don't worry about that one. I'm not liable if he does that. <laughs> I guess yeah, the latest one is not working. Anyway, set in Japan, the government traps a class of high school students, and they're forced to fight to the death at some mysterious abandoned high school. And the reasons are for research, but it's also to instill distrust in an unruly, an unruly populace. Like, try to work with the person whose son killed your son. Like, just try. It's also a survival of the fitness, and it's also standardized testing gone too far. Like, imagine if you just call everyone who fails the SAT. Actually, that's a YouTube Red movie, never mind. Yeah? It's been a while since I've seen this movie, but I remember the plot being set up as you kids are being disrespectful little shits just across the country, so we're going to make an example out of your class to get the rest of your generation back in line. Wow. Oh, yeah, yeah. Damage Japan. That's, that's what I remember the one. <laughs> <laughs> so, the Hunter Games has nothing to do with Battle Royale. Actually, I do think the author said that it was an influence. Like, I, I, I haven't seen either movie, so I can't really say. In a post apocalyptic world, the world is 
ruled by a tyrannical government called the capital that forces people from each of their conquered districts to give two teenagers a tribute. One, is it one male, one female, or is it just two? Uh, one male, one female. One male. Yeah. Okay. And the reason <laughs> I'm starting is because uh, one of the districts rebelled. So basically, after after annihilating that district, the government says, like, we're going to punish everyone by having hung in the year. Like I said, Battle Royale. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they use, like, young kids. Like, the movies, they a, a look older, but the ages are, like... It's 12 to 18. Yeah. Okay. They are well, children. In the movies, like, they, they don't... Who wants to see a movie where young, kid-looking kids actually kill each other? Yes. Also, also, it's a metaphor for standardized testing because a lot of these games are about standardized testing. Trust me, just as a metaphor. So, in uh, this is sort of a variation of a death game where it's about convicts. The idea is that when you deal with convicts, it's fine because they were on death row anyway and they deserve it. Even though this clearly violates the Geneva Convention. Oh, yes. Uh, yes, yes, it violates the Geneva Convention. Well, I guess only if it's POWs, but you know what? Sometimes POWs. Yes. You, anyway, the viewers can enjoy the violence because the players deserve it. Yeah? In the original one, uh, they were just, it was like NASCAR. And you got points for you got points for hitting other people, hitting people. Yeah, youth of Asia Day, where you bring the old people up, up right over. You get to the sidewalk, waiting for you to kill the other people. <laughs> they were to push the people out. They, they had to push the people out in the street to get hit. You know, the old people and the same people push them out and this side of the car. You got extra points to the doctor and the interns who were sitting on the sidewalk waiting for you to hit the other guy. Wow. The Mission Car again was an influence. Uh, maybe I need to see the original death of the race. Okay. Robert Kearney and Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> right, viewers can enjoy the thought. Like I said, viewers can enjoy the violence because it's to people who theoretically deserve it. And you, and people just like watching violent movies anyway, so I don't know why that's the okay, case. So, <clears throat> so why do death games resonate? Like, why are death games so common now? Why are there the whole literary genre basically based around the Hunger Games? Because Hunger Games popular. Why is it popular? Like. It's because people see it as the next step of our current society where we're living in a pre dystopian world. So, this is what they view as the next step. And so, people are reading it so much because they see it as our actual reality or but something that is humanity possible. has already had it before. I know. It was a Roman comedy. Yes. Maybe. Yeah. Well, Chris. I'd say that life has game-like elements, and life, in life you have to be in competition. You're in competition to jobs, you're in competition for grades, you're in competition to get into college, like I said, a lot of these are about standardized testing, and you're in competition for a lot of things, and this factor has caused an internal stress inside the audience that can be relieved or at least used by a clever author in these death game scenarios. We want to see ourselves and our heroes, and if our heroes can succeed against the tyranny of the SAT, then maybe we can be the SAT. What? That's what these are And again, that's it. Yeah, standardized testing is overrated. It's also like an exciting experience. And we also have our own death game. Yeah. They probably don't want me describing it as a death game. No. No. It's a tag it never gets hurt. Not if they follow the rules. How many people do that? I follow the rules. I feel like I always should have a kid. What? 
I feel like if you shoot, if you shoot, a, if you shoot a zombie in the head, they should just be out of the game for a minute. The game will be over in uh, 30 minutes. Yeah, which I feel like is good yeah, if, you, if, you, if you're yeah, actually good at it. No, no. <laughs> All right, I feel like it's not like a victory. No. The the so uh, just to go back to Homo Ludens for a moment. Uh, so game designer, game designer Eric Zimmerman, that was supposed to be in Z. I'm sorry. It's a, it's described as 21st, he describes the 21st century as the ludic century. A century where being able to play, make, and experience games will become important to the human experience. The same way tw the 20th century became about the spread of data technology and technology in general, this will be about like data technology exploding and the only way we can even get a handle of it is through the magic of games. And the world is one system, the people need to understand these systems. He views this as a games as systems approach. And games will help advance mankind. There's so many VR in the back. All right, let's go back to Heisenberg for a moment. put much money into it. He felt that play was becoming less a factor since the 20th, since basically the 18th century. You remember, he felt that culture starts as play, but then becomes tradition and rules. Well, as it becomes more traditions and rules, it becomes less playful. And he feels that humanity has lost touch with play, and now we're going to have to experience World War II. No, uh, this was back in the history. Yeah, Homo Ludens was released in 1938. Uh, right. Yeah, if only we had more get if only we had more were more in touch with our inner playful self, maybe we could avoid World War II. Isn't that the same class as it's not like a lot of the Yeah, there is the Maybe. Maybe I don't remember that episode. So what you're saying is that we need to we need to uh, resolve wars by a Nazi branch. what? Maybe we I believe the, the point he was trying to make is that play uh, was made tradition and then co-opted by nationalist groups, nationalist and fascist groups, and these people, for some reason, this is where Homo Ludens loses me. Like, it was all for the culture part. It was all for his definition of play and the play element. But then when he tries to elaborate this about modern society, both modern at his time, I don't really get it. Like, I don't think one or two happened because we lost our ability to play. I think we lost our ability to play with World of One. So. Like, but it's still interesting how what is described as ludic. Ludic means playful, by the way. The, basically the playing century, and Homo Ludens basically means playing man. And here's a person who says that modern society is less playful than it was. So lastly, I want to talk about the idea that storytelling itself is a game, especially sci-fi storytelling. <laughs> so this is not a game, it should be, but this is not a game. This is a movie. But is the production of the movie a game? Is it playful? Is, Production playful. So we have all these people involved who are trying to produce the best possible product with measurable units of success, uh, with elaborate rules, conventions, strategies, and uh, all placed in a magic circle, also known as the set or the cutting room floor. So we have sort of a game of cinematic universes. And we have DC. <clears throat> Both are working on the rules and conventions of the superhero genre. Measurement of success in the box office, cultural and artistic, bring people based on broad tomato scores. And both are made up with teams of diverse skill sets. Marvel is about the solid, uh, solid strategy, their phased implementation of movies, starting with basically origin movies, but then moving on to movies that develop upon it and then making team-up movies. And DC is still working things out. They still work things out. You can say that they're, like, I hope they succeed. So let's look at what a science fiction, a science fiction uh, story requires. It requires the characters, settings, characters, thoughts, and conflict thoughts. Now, some science fiction works can focus more on settings, some science fiction works can get away by focusing more on character. But these are the general four. 
We see the big competition and you need big villains, elaborate, intense spectacle, amazing powers. You need to make the audience feel good about the world and you want to make them wanting more. So if you ever so whenever you make a superhero movie, you basically need to adhere to these. Like you could subvert some of these rules, and there's other rules that are sort of unwitting, more subtle, uh, stuff like that. But yeah, there are rules. And when you're following these rules, your job is to create the best possible movie within these constraints. And that sounds an awful lot like a game to me. Do you guys agree? Uh, I can tell you that making star missions feels like a lot like a game to me. Yeah. But this is a star mission. So who here has made a star mission before? So who here feels that it was sort of like a playful exercise to make a star mission? You're not doing it right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Trying to think of the best way to get your point across, following the format of the star mission, trying to keep it within the time limits, trying to outdo the other star missions, trying to prove yourself the best of star missions. <laughs> okay, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the where it's like, when you talk about something you enjoy, it can definitely feel like a game to yourself. And making it look like a game to everyone else is could be a goal. That's what you have. Yeah. Uh, but anything I learned, uh, in every job that must be done, there's an element of fun. <laughs> and that's all I think we could say about that song before we get sued. All right, then that's basically the end of what I have. So like I said, my name is Michael Cooper. I'm a game design development major, but I also minor in economics, political science, and MIS. I have business cards if you're interested. I'd like to exchange business cards. And also, guess how many slides this was? 74. So it just raised up four fingers in the back. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You don't have that in here. No, it's 74. No. 74? Yes. Three and a third. You guys ready for the answer to this game? Sure. Oh. <laughs> I'm still under Disney Princesses. What? <laughs> How many were in Disney Princesses? Over 100. <laughs> well, guys, I think I lost. I lost. I lost the game. All right. So. All right, I think it's second. <laughs> so, a couple of closing comments before we go. Um, for posters, make sure to pick up posters as you head out. But post membership, buy your merch, and above all, buy your tickets to Starfest Woo, Star from Tulio right Yay! here right now, right after the mission, as soon as I say the mission is over, which it is right now. Woo, buy your tickets. This is your last chance to buy this guy.